Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. You know Teddy, my buddy who is popping in to say hello for Friday Reads. This is going to be an interesting Friday Reads because I don't have a whole lot of reading updates. We'll get to the actual Friday Reads portion of the video in a moment. I'll put a link or a timestamp down below if you would like to jump to that part of the video and skip the rest, but the rest is going to be the majority of this video since Again, not too much to report in the way of reading this week, and we'll get to why that is when we do the Friday Reads portion. First, just a quick note to say that this was a big week because we got the long list for the Women's Prize for Fiction. My reaction will be down below. Mixed response to that long list. I think a lot of people kind of wanted to see some heavier hitters in there and were a little confused by the preponderance of debut authors that were on the list. But, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting list to look at. There are some good books that had not been on my radar before. And again, you can check out more about that in the description box down below, where the link to that will be. We will also be getting the long list for the International Booker Prize on Monday. Monday is going to be a crazy day, but I will try to get a reaction video out the same day. It's possible that my reaction won't come until Tuesday, but I will be talking about it. I have almost never read <laughs> the books that are on the International Booker list because I, I do read translated fiction, but usually there are a lot of surprises. But I love the International Booker list because it introduces me to a lot of books. So I'm really excited to have that long list and I will be doing a video about it. The only question is if you'll get it on Monday because there will just be a lot going on work-wise and you know in, in other ways uh, on Monday. So I will try to get that up. And then we get a bit of a break. We don't get any new book prize updates until March 27th when we get the shortlist for the Women's Prize for nonfiction. <laughs> He's going to sleep sitting up, which is interesting. So if you're getting snores, that Teddy is what's happening there. Yeah, so then at the end of March, we get the shortlist for the Women's Prize for nonfiction. And then in April, we will get the shortlist for the International Booker and the Women's Prize for fiction. And then, yeah, so we have a break until the end of March, but Monday we'll be getting the shortlist for the International Booker. And stay tuned to this space or just, you know, other spaces, because I'm not the only person who will be talking about it. But yeah, I will be doing a reaction video to that. I will also quickly mention that the Oscars are going to be on Sunday. If you follow along, you know, I am a big fan of the Oscars. It's sort of like a pet obsession on the side. I don't tend to talk about movies too much on this since, you know, it's a booktube channel. So it would be a little off brand. But I printed ballots, one for me and one for Joel. We always have a friendly competition where we see who gets the most right. And I have put joined Vanity Fair's Oscar pool. I don't think there's a prize for it, but they have one. So I, I love, they have a podcast that talks about, uh, it's mostly about the Oscars, but it also talks about the Emmys. So I, I love that. And uh, yeah, so I'm really excited that that is coming on Sunday. The big thing <laughs> to talk about this week, I was genuinely surprised that a couple of people reached out to me to ask if I was going to talk about this or suggesting that I talk about this or saying that they hope they hear me talk about this. I just, I don't consider myself to be an authority on it, but people seem to want to hear what I have to say about it, or at least five people do. <laughs> so that's not a whole lot of people, but it's not nothing. Still, I was surprised that five people reached out to ask. So I am wearing my Let the Queens Read t-shirt, which you can't see because you know, Teddy is here, but I feel like at this point, if Teddy is not in a Friday Reads video, people will riot. <laughs> anyway, the thing people have been, or five people have been reaching out, wondering if I would talk about or hoping that I would talk about is the situation with Shop Queer, which turned into Alstora this week with the announcement that RuPaul was joining as a co-founder. I assume he gets the title of co-founder for this new version of Shop Queer, which is called Allstora. Again, 
I had supported Shop Queer in the past. I purchased this copy of The Deviant's War, The Homosexual versus the United States of America by Eric Cervini from them. It is signed. I'm, my right arm is holding Teddy <laughs> because he is falling asleep again. So they would put these little book plates in that were signed. I have another book that I had ordered from Shop Queer. It, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was by George M. Johnson. And it all had a, the same sort of book plate in it. And Eric Cervini was one of the co-founders of Shop Queer and is now one of the co-founders of Allstora. And the thing is, Shop Queer obviously catered to promoting and supporting and introducing queer authors to people and getting queer stories out there. And as part of that, they had the Rainbow Book Bus and they wanted to use it. They were raising money to get it going. And it, I believe it is getting started this year. Uh, and now it has spun off into its own charitable organization. And it, it is not officially part of Allstora anymore. But that book bus will be getting queer stories into areas, uh, especially areas where there are problems with book banning and censorship to try to help queer stories stay out there and help people access queer stories. It's a great mission. I mentioned Shop Queer several times, which is probably why these five people uh, kind of wanted me to say something about it. So what is the problem? Well, <laughs> part of the controversy is about the name. And I admit the name did immediately jump out to me as something that I don't like. <laughs> First, because it's a little confusing. Caleb Trask, who had messaged me on Discord about this, had said that it sounds like a drag queen. It does sound like a drag queen, which I guess kind of makes sense because RuPaul is involved <laughs> in this. But it also represents a shift in the mission statement of the store. Going from Shop Queer to All Store, which is that it represents all stories. And I admit that does feel a bit like a slap in the face. I don't think it's on the same level in any way, but I do feel like I have a bit more of an understanding of what it would probably feel like for a black person when someone says black lives matter and then someone else says all lives matter, because that is kind of what it's doing. You're going from a store that said queer stories matter to a store that says all stories matter. And they went from, I think, 3,000 titles that they offered to about 10 million titles that they offer for to be ordered from them. And the reason they are able to do that is that they are relying on Ingram. If you are unfamiliar, Ingram is a book distributor. When I worked at Borders in the 2000s, Ingram pretty much had a lock on the marketplace. There were others, like Baker and Taylor, who would distribute books and you would order from, but Ingram was like the primary book distributor for Borders and for many other stores out there. Nowadays, you can order directly from the publishers. I don't know if that was an option back then. Maybe it was an option, but it's more possible now. I don't know. Since I worked at Borders, we really only worked through our corporate office and you know, corporate likes corporate. So we worked with Ingram for the most part. So Ingram is a book distributor. It's like a huge book distributor. They have 10 million titles. So basically, Allstora is just offering you Ingram's catalog. And that's what it is. The problem with offering Ingram's catalog is that it offers a lot of books that are not only not queer, but are anti-queer in a lot of ways. Something that people have really latched onto is that you can order a copy of Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler, or you could, they, that may have changed, which is very much not the mission of Shop Queer and not even the mission of what Allstora purports to do. So it, it's just, it's a problem. Allstora has been very quiet in the face of this controversy and these complaints, they haven't really said anything. If Apparently, if you went to the website, and I had not done this, but other people have reported that when you went on it, there would be a sign that said, 
I'm going to read off of this article from Vulture, which I will link down below. This is a little out of date because apparently there has been an update today. Uh, but a pop-up note on the site's homepage alerts vis visitors that, quote, you may find books you disagree with, end quote. The note, attributed to All Stories team, states that the store doesn't agree with every book it carries, but argues, quote, we cannot fight the ideolo ideologies of hate if we lack the ability to study, understand, and react to them. We do that by reading books, end quote. And I have some quibbles <laughs> with that statement. We don't need to spend a lot of time on it. But using the Mein Kampf example, which doesn't really hold up, but I don't need to read Mein Kampf to know that I don't like Hitler's ideology. But that doesn't really hold up because I have been taught a lot about Hitler and what he did in school and in movies and things like that. So I already know a lot about it. You know, there is something to be said for listening to arguments, but I feel like in this country, we have become a bit beholden to the idea that we need to have both sides of an argument and promote both of them, even when one side of the argument is pretty flatly wrong, such as with uh, topics of climate change. Pretty much the entire scientific community agrees that climate change is a problem that we need to address. And the less scientific opinion is that eh, maybe not. <laughs> but institutions like, say, the New York Times feel like they need to appear impartial by telling you about both sides and letting you make up your own mind. However, again, science is behind the fact that climate change is a problem. So, yes, it's important to listen to people and what they believe and things like that, but you don't have to promote hateful opinions that are largely wrong. You know, you don't need to be selling books. That, there was an example in an article, not the Vulture one, I don't, I, it was something else. But you can order books that are aimed at children that say that, being transgender isn't a real thing. That's not good. <laughs> and the update today is that apparently a lot of titles have been removed. Not all titles, but a lot of titles. The most offensive titles that people were m m complaining about the most have been removed from the site. Which is good. Again, it's not everything, but it's a start. And you know, I'm, I am going to kind of wait to see what happens. So far, there hasn't really been a statement. Oh, Teddy would like down, so I'm going to let him go. <laughs> so far, there hasn't really been any statement or reaction to the controversy. Let's see what happens. I, you know, I don't really want to squash or complain about a queer business. I kind of want to wait and see what they say or what they do. But it's not great. Like I said, moving from sh the title Shop Queer to all Stora really does feel like someone saying queer stories matter and then somebody else saying, oh no, no, all stories matter. And to give them the benefit of the doubt, to me, this feels a little bit like a Shark Tank thing. Like Shop Queer was a small organization and it was aiming to grow and continue to get its message out to more people and expand the mission and uh, get queer books in people's hands. But it was, again, it was a small organization. Eric Cervini is a known person. I believe he's won an Emmy. He did a TV show about gay history. He obviously wrote this book about gay history, which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. He's not nobody, but he's not RuPaul. So it's almost like going on Shark Tank. You have a business that has a concept, an idea, and a foundation that you have built but you need to grow and scale is a bit of a problem. You need someone like one of the sharks on Shark Tank. And when they come in and bring their money and their name and all of that stuff, they want you to change because they want to maximize their profit. Now, I'm not saying RuPaul did this. Possibly RuPaul's business manager wanted a lot of changes. And, you know, the market for, say, Shop Queer is pretty niche. Having a bookstore caters to a lot of people. And RuPaul's brand appeals to more than just the queer community. There are straight women who absolutely love RuPaul's Drag Race and follow RuPaul. So you add them as a potential customer base when you expand to have a lot of different stories and have 
a book club led by RuPaul. You know, that's just the thing. There are a lot, a lot of straight men who love RuPaul's Drag Race as well. So you're expanding your customer base by having all stories, not just queer stories. But when you're part of the queer community, it does feel unfortunate. So I will be interested to see what they do, if they do anything. Uh, you know, the fact that they have removed a lot of these titles from their catalog means that they're stepping in the right direction. I do kind of wish that they would publicly say something. And at least as of this morning, they had not still. Maybe they will, but it doesn't feel like they are interested in making a statement. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know what they will do. And again, I don't want to hate on a queer business or a queer owned business, but I do think the way this was handled was very clumsy. And I definitely think it it, 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 is, it is driven by capitalism and the desire for bigger profits and all of that stuff. But the original idea that Eric Savini and the original uh, co-founder who, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know his name. I want to say it's Adam Powell, but I can't say that with any confidence. Uh, the, the business mission of Shop Queer was great. That's why I talked about it. That's why I wanted to support them and order from them. Will I support Alstora? Remains to be seen because I want to give them a chance to address this, but it's not a good start. And we'll see. So a lot, five people, I was going to say a lot of people, five people kind of asked me to talk about this or said that they hoped I would talk about this. And I, I want to acknowledge it as such. It's a problem. I hope they fix it. it. It seems like they've at least taken a step toward fixing it today, but more would need to be done. And I definitely don't like the fact that they transitioned from being specifically for queer people to being about everybody. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a bookstore that caters toward queer stories. You know, occasionally people will complain because I love the Pulitzer Prize. People will complain, but it's only open to American and that feels wrong in, in this day and age. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with having a prize that caters to American authors. I don't think there's an, anything wrong with having a bookstore that caters to queer audiences, you know. And if you want to say, do you think there's anything wrong with like a straight pride parade or anything like that? I mean, that the problem is that's everything else <laughs> for the most part. Hi, editing Greg is jumping in quickly because I feel like I was trying to rush through that point and those examples. And it's actually probably worth spending a little bit of extra time on it to just kind of explain what I mean by that. So Part of the reason Shop Queer was great and felt important and was like something that I wanted to support is that it's still important to get visibility for the queer community because we don't have a lot of acceptance in large parts <laughs> of the United States and the world. So visibility is really important. Sharing stories is important. And we really need to help lift up other parts of the community as well because you know we are a big community with a lot of different parts and certain parts of that community are more discriminated against than others. So we need to sort of lift up all of those stories. So transitioning away from a mission of visibility for queer people and making it about all stories is part of the problem. And the reason a straight pride parade isn't necessary is visibility. Why would, why do you need visibility for straight pride? It's not a problem, but you do need visibility for gay pride and gay communities and things like that. And there is a bit of a connection with the Pulitzer because its original intent more than 100 years ago was to legitimize American forms of art. That is why the Pulitzer Prize, which is a journalism prize for the most part, has those categories for fiction, drama, music, and so on, because at the time you needed to legitimize American art. And you could argue that that's not so necessary now. However, there is a bit of snobbery toward American art in, in Europe. You know, it was only somewhere around 2008 or 2009 that someone in Europe was very publicly, and I think they had a connection to the Swedish Academy, which awards the Nobel Prize, uh, if I remember, where they just kind of said, it'll be a long time before Americans win the Nobel Prize, because they're just not very good compared to Europe. So there is still a bit of snobbery afoot. You, you don't really need the visibility and sense of legitimacy anymore, but it is still there. So, you know, the reason you would have something specific like 
a store dedicated to queer stories or a gay pride parade or something like that is because you need visibility and awareness and you just don't need that for straight pride. That's all. Back to the rest of the video. And yeah, sure, there are problems with rainbow capitalism. I don't really want to get into that here, but you know, uh, rainbow capitalism, if you're unfamiliar, uh, comes up a lot during Pride because you'll have companies who will change their logos to be rainbows, who sponsor floats in the Pride Parade. Do they actually do much of anything to support the queer community is a question. It's something that is performative as an ally or as part of the queer community, but might not actually have much substance. So indications are that Alstora is at least in that ballpark, if not part of that. But, you know, I kind of want to wait and see what they do. That feels fair to me. So uh, that is all I guess I would say. I don't know if I said much of anything, but that's kind of what I will say about it. If you have thoughts about the situation, I would love to hear them in the comment section down below. You know, I, I would like to at least give Eric Cervini the benefit of the doubt because I think he is definitely someone who is mission-driven to get queer stories out there and to support the LGBTQ plus community. So we'll see how this situation develops and what happens. I want to give at least him the benefit of the doubt, but we shall see. So the other thing to mention before we get into the actual Friday reads is that the Penn Faulkner Award announced its finalists. And I'm not going to do a full reaction video about that, but I will quickly mention the finalists. They are Witness by Jamel Brinkley, which is a book that I have wanted to read since it was published and still have managed to not get around to. And at this point, I probably won't get to it before the Pulitzer Prize announcement because I think it has an outside chance. It's a short story collection and short stories just really don't win the Pulitzer Prize. If anything, it has to be a linked story collection these days, but maybe there will be a surprise. Who knows? But anyway, this is now a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award. Open Throat by Henry Hoke, which I read last week, and my discussion of it will be in the Friday Reads that I will link down below. Uh, that is also a finalist, as is What Happened to Ruthie Ramirez by Claire Jimenez. Absolution by Alice McDermott, which I definitely think is in the Pulitzer conversation and probably stands a better chance than Witness, because this is an author who has been in the mix for the Pulitzer Prize before, and it, just the subject matter of the book and the way it's a beautifully written book. So definitely a Pulitzer contender there. And the final finalist is Users by Colin Winnett. So if you have thoughts about the Penn Faulkner, let me know about that in the comment section down below as well. Now, let's get to the actual Friday Reads portion of this video. I said it in the beginning of the video, I did not have a very successful reading week. There are a lot of reasons for that, but the primary reason is that it just ended up being an incredibly busy week with work, and I have been trying... I haven't really talked about this part, but since I had the sinus surgery in January, I have been trying to be more responsible about going to sleep at night. For a while after the surgery, I was actually getting the best sleep of my life. Not for the first two weeks. The first two weeks, it was really difficult to sleep because they still have like the packing in there and breathing is actually kind of difficult. Once the packing came out, I was getting the best sleep I've had probably ever, or at least since I was a child. And now that I'm starting to feel better, the bad habits are creeping back in. But one thing I have tried not to do is listen to an audiobook before bed. Because what would happen is I would start listening to an audiobook, and then like an hour later, I would actually go to bed. So I'd be going to bed, like, and usually we go to bed somewhere around 10 or 11. So I'd be going to bed at midnight or more likely 1 a.m. And that's not good. So I'm trying not to fall back into that habit. The problem is that now that I'm not doing that, I'm noticing that I have cut out... <laughs> the majority of my time to listen to an audiobook. And I'm trying to adjust to that and figure out ways to do it. Because I don't always have time to do that during the workday. And for that reason, I have not finished my audiobook as much, even though I really wanted to. And that audiobook is Mrs. Quinn's Rise to Fame by Olivia Ford. So if you saw my monthly wrap-up with Joel, hey, Teddy, 
He just ran back in the room. <laughs> He's leaving already. Uh, Joel read Mrs. Quinn's Rise to Fame in February and really loved it. And I had been interested in it. I actually am going to take bragging rights and say that I pointed Joel in that book's direction. But uh, he loved that book. And even though I am trying to read Irish books in the month of March, I committed to starting my month off with that on audio. And I'm loving it. I am, I think, a little more than 50% left. I have... Um, I'm a little more than 50% of the way through the book, I should say. And I have about two hours left. Really liking it. It's a lot of fun. I just wasn't able to finish it. So the premise of the book is that you have a woman, obviously, named Mrs. Quinn, who is 77 years old and joins a show called Britain Bakes, which is obviously a stand-in for the Great British Bake Off. The beginning of the book is about her deciding to apply and then going through the audition process and then <laughs> Teddy is just running back and forth for attention. So let me try to get through this part a little quickly. Um, she auditions. She gets on the show. So the show doesn't actually start until about halfway through the book, which is kind of interesting. But it's about her journey on the show. And uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's really exciting. And it kind of flashes back to tell a lot about her life before and how this is her finally stepping out and doing something for herself. Really interesting book. I'm really liking it. I hope to be done with it soon. The problem is also this weekend, you know, you do have the Oscars on Sunday, which is going to take up a, a lot of time. But also Joel and I are going to be going to Helena this weekend. So I don't know how much reading time I'm going to have. We'll see. I don't know how much progress I will make on any of these books, <laughs> but I am really enjoying Mrs. Quinn's Rise to Fame. I wish I had been able to finish it this week. It's just that the cards were not aligned or the stars were not aligned in that direction. So hopefully I will finish it really quickly and then can pivot to an audiobook that has more to do with my March TBR, which is all about Irish books. And I'll link that video down below if you have not seen that one as well. I did start the month with a print book that met the Irish brief that I have set for myself in March, and that was Twisted, The Tangled History of Black Hair Culture by Emma DeBerry. I wanted to start the month with this one because I had assumed that it would read quickly, and it kind of does, but it is a little more academic than I had expected it to be. And that's not really a bad thing. It's nice that this isn't a book that is just talking about, you know, you know, feelings. It does have Emma DeBerry's personal experience with the way she is treated for the color of her skin, but also for the uh, curl in her hair. But it's not just going off of that. Like, she brings the receipts with research and data and telling stories and going back and tell showing historical records where people talk in awful ways about judgments about people based on their skin and the way their hair is textured. It's it's awful. However, it is a little more academic, and that did make me get through this a lot more slowly than I had anticipated. So I finished the first section, finally. It, it, it's only <laughs> 44 pages into the book. And I thought to myself, you know, I think because this is a little more academic, I might want to drag this out a little bit. Because I got this from the library, but it's, I have time. I don't need to rush my way through it. So I can hold on to this and sort of keep coming back to this throughout the month and work my way through it that way. So I, after I finished the first section, I ended up picking up The Country Girls by Edna O'Brien. Now, I've committed to reading at least the first in this trilogy, which is called The Country Girls, but it is a trilogy of books. And I'm blanking on what the names of the other ones are. It is The Country Girls, followed by The Lonely Girl, and then Girls in Their Married Bliss, and then there's an epilogue, and all of that is in this one book. So it's a big, chunky book. However, The Country Girls is about 175 pages. So I've committed to that one. And depending on time, how much I like The Country Girls and all of that stuff... I may continue or I may read The Country Girls and then pivot to some other Irish books. The thing is, I'm only 20 pages in and it's been two days and I got most of this done. I had a doctor's appointment yesterday and in the waiting room, I read the majority of that 20 pages and it's just that kind of a week. I haven't spent a lot of time reading. Uh, I spent a lot of my time in the evenings actually watching movies instead of reading because Joel was traveling. Um... And that's just how I spent my time. It was kind of like, because the 
work week was so intense by the time the day was over i didn't really feel like have i didn't really feel like i had the mental capacity to focus on a book and i think that's part of why even though this isn't heavily academic I just didn't really have the mental capacity for it. So I think revisiting this and spreading it out throughout the month will be good. But I also just didn't really feel like picking up a novel either. So that's kind of where I'm at. Now, again, I don't know how much time I'm going to have to read over the weekend. So we'll see. Joel will be traveling early next week. And then yeah, we'll just see how things go. I'm hoping that I will at least finish... The Country Girls and Mrs. Quinn's Rise to Fame. And then we'll see if I dive a little further into this. Maybe make a sprint to finish it. Or if I go to another book from my Irish TBR. But that's how my week has been going. And how my reading life has been going. Let me know what you've been reading, watching, loving. I'm trying to remember some of the movies that I watched this week. Uh, we did attempt to watch Poor Things when it debuted on Hulu and because it was one of the few big contenders for the Oscars that I had not seen and we turned it off <laughs> after maybe 45 minutes. That's all I need to say about that. But um, yeah, uh, that that was something that we attempted to watch and uh, yeah, that but that's how I, I, I have been watching a lot of older Oscar movies or Oscar nominated movies uh, recently. Like I watched Gaslight, which I hadn't watched since I was in my 20s and actually had a lot of fun with it. I remember thinking it was just okay and I had a lot of fun with it. Same with uh, Suspicion, which I remember thinking I didn't like particularly, but they had the drama in that movie. That's a movie where somebody just needed a gay friend to tell her, honey, listen to these red flags. <laughs> anyway, that's kind of what I've been up to. I would love to hear what you've been up to in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.